welcome to the show, Javina. It is an Thank honor you. to have someone of such high standing in the world, but with such a grand scale of humility as well. It is so unusual in these days, and you carry your calling and your purpose with grace. And uh, I've read up on your background, as with all of my guests, uh, I do intense research with what you supply me with in terms of your biography, and I dig a little deeper because I'm that kind of person and I need to know. Yeah. So we are honored at the People of Purpose talk show to have you as our guest. I think someone like you in the sphere of career women in, in mining is a game changer for little girls and for grown women, because I think representation matters. It mm. does. And you bring that to the table. You really are a part of South Africa that I value. And therefore, I am happy to share with the world at large, my world and yours, just how amazing you are today. Because the show is about people of purpose. The People of Purpose talk show focuses heavily on real people talking about life. And you're real, you're authentic, you love your children and your husband and your life and your home so much, you would rather not be talking out there. But you have to do this because you've been promoted into the world in such a way. And therefore you stand tall in your calling and you do it with such grace and dignity. And therefore God has blessed you in a phenomenal way. And from what I gather, as I read up on you, is that you just keep climbing. So I think that there are women and men on various um, uh, social media platforms today. Well, especially Facebook. We will post it later on the other platforms. I think they will be very encouraged by what you have to say and just what you've experienced in the world of work. And this, um, well, you know, we are a country of amazing resources. We have it all in SA. But I am surprised to find how few South Africans actually know how rich we are in resources. Mm. And therefore, when I discovered you through Beulah, it was fascinating. Wow, you have a niece in my name? I want to know more. So let's begin the interview. I think we're two minutes into the hour. So let's go for it. Are you happy to go for it? Absolutely. Wonderful. You're comfortable. You're feeling yeah. good in my virtual studio. Great. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Right. So manganese mining. Mm. It is a significant industry in SA. And it holds the, and we actually hold the largest known manganese reserves in the world. It is estimated that South Africa owns around 80% of global reserves. Mm. Can you share with me the key points of how manganese mining has impacted the South African economy, Javina? So thank you, Michelle. And I think before I get into it, thank you for having me on your show. Um, I certainly am humbled by the invitation to just to share my story and where I come from and also, you know, the world of mining. So just to answer your question, I think for me, um, you know, I would have never known that we have such a rich reserve in manganese until I moved to the Northern Cape. So I'm from Richards Bay. So that is all I've known for most of my life. So moving here into the Kalahari Basin, was um, a real game changer for me. You are right, um, the Kalahari Basin uh, holds about 80% of the world's manganese reserves. And I think why that is so important, it really is a major economic backbone for our country. It's a major contributor as well to our Africa's or to South Africa's GDP um, and supports a range of economic activities. 
I think really key in the South African climate is that job creation is, is a result and an outcome of manganese mining. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to actually influence and impact the local economy and even to provide jobs for our local uh, communities as well. And also to consider um, youngsters who are growing up in the Kalahari Basin to be able to be exposed to mining and to get involved in the mining sector. I think investment and infrastructure is also key through manganese mining. We are able to develop our local co communities. We are able to give back to the communities, but also having an opportunity to upgrade railways and ports um, so that we can deliver timelessly to, uh, to the market. Um, regional development as well is also key. I think um, with the deposits that we find here in the manganese basin, the communities are definitely growing in terms of uh, contributing to the local sector and being able to be part of the mining society. We certainly have our challenges. So when it comes to price fluctuations, I think that's something that we need to manage quite carefully. If you're unable to meet your market demands, you cannot really contribute to the economy. But it's also a strategic, uh, it's, it's strategically important and it's a commodity that is strategically placed in the world because manganese is used in various ele or elements um, and manganese is used to influence the world in so many different ways. So, um, I certainly have learned a lot about the product since moving into mining and it's opened up my world as well to know, you know, how valuable the commodity is and what a big impact it's making out there. So that's just some of the ways that um, the manganese uh, or manganese can actually contribute. Marvelous. That's brilliant. I can tell you have such a strong background and knowledge of the product and the industry. <laughs> I suppose being in it for so long, it becomes part of who you are. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I guess in layman's terms, you know, manganese is your thing and you talk about it. So all of you understand it within the organization. But for myself and people like me who really don't have a sufficient understanding of manganese, and I suppose this happens to you from time to time when you meet with friends, family, and they say so... Javina, what is manganese? Yeah, so um, I wish I could show you a picture of it, but it's a black rock that we get from the earth. It is mined out. You can mine it from underground mining activities or from um, surface activities as well. Based on how you would use the product, it's processed, and then it's dispatched into the market for different uses. So uh, it's, quite a or it's quite a versatile material. Uh, it's used in several applications, but I think the most common that we know of is steel production. So it's used in the steel, yeah, in the steel industry. Um, it helps to improve on the toughness of the steel, uh, also makes it um, or makes its strength better to work with. I think batteries as well is also another major impact in what manganese is used for. I think we know that the world is changing, so battery technology. Is, is growing, so manganese is used for that as well. Um, it's also used as an alloy, so it's mixed with other products um, and it's used for various manufacturing um, processes. But I think you'll also um, be familiar with it um, and, and something that I've learned is that it's also used for glass and ceramic manufacturing. So it provides the colors between, you know, pink, or it ranges from pink to brown. So that is because of manganese being, being used in the products. And yeah, electronics, agriculture, fertilizer, there's, there is a component of manganese that is actually um, used in those processes. So it's quite various, it ranges quite far and wide. So it's quite important, you know, for, for the economic climate and to sustain so many processes. Amazing, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that and that uh, it is used in ceramics. That's interesting because I used to paint ceramics at one time. Yeah. And, uh, who, who knew? So Javina, I have to ask, what is life like 
in the Northern Cape, and especially in what you refer to as the Kalahari Basin. Now, I live in the garden route, and mm. I'm always going on about it being such a fascinating place on Earth, the garden route. Ever since I came here, no place on the planet is as good as the garden <laughs> route. So the thing is, um, you know, I want to know more about the Kalahari Basin, and especially for our viewers who are watching on various platforms, uh, who've never been, whose geography is, well, not there. So can you tell us a little? It's not to say that my geography is any better, <laughs> but I do know that we are quite close to the Namibia border and the Sutu as well. Look, um, like I said, I would have never known what the Kalahari was about until I moved here with my family. Um, it takes some getting used to because it's quite different to what we would know, you know, growing up in the cities or growing up next to infrastructure. Um, but life here is amazing. It's peaceful. Uh, it allows you to grow with your family. I think for me, that has been the biggest blessing for my family and I to be able to grow together without any external influence, just fully understanding each other and finding each other. I think this is what the move or this is the, the way that the move has impacted us. We are able to lean on each other and really grow together yeah. as a family. Um, in terms of the environment, yes, um, you do have your developed areas, which is closer to the Uppington areas, Kimberley and so forth. Mm -hmm. But for where I stay in the Northern Cape, uh, it's a little mining town called Hotezal which is about 20 kilometers away from the vessels mine that I work at. Mm -hmm. So it's a safe town. I think the blessing that we have to live in Hotezal is that it's safe. Our kids are able to play in the street, ride their bicycles, walk to school. You don't often get that in other parts of the country. Um, you are able to, to actually find peace after a long day at work. Wow. Um, and that is what the town offers. And I guess what's also really great for me is the ability to be able to network because many of us who live in the town are actually living away from family. So you learn to lean on each other, you grow together, you learn to ask for help, which is something that you don't often do. Um, the Kalahari Basin as well has some interesting areas to visit. Um, it, for the first time, I visited the Vondervac Caves here quite quite close to home where you actually find the original paintings of the Khoisan wow. so that was quite interesting oh, we have a yeah we have a meerkat or meerkat manor if I oh, you to do. You it do. correctly yeah. 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 yeah yeah so um at the Tswalu game reserve there is a meerkat project that is running to preserve the species. So that is quite interesting. We're not too far away from the uh, Kalahari trans, uh, trans Frontier um, Reserve. So many photographers out there would know this game reserve and come to photograph mm -hmm. wildlife. Mm -hmm. And then I think quite famous here is the Tswalu Game Reserve, owned by the Oppenheimers. It has an exclusive restaurant owned by Klein Yan, which who is a Michelin star restaurant. Uh, or who has a Michelin star um, restaurant. So that's just a few things to explore here in the Northern Cape. But if you want safety, if you want peace and quiet, and you just want to be in touch with nature and grow as a family, it's the perfect place to settle at. Well, I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear yeah. that your joy is sufficient in this place. Because, you know, uh, well, I have to ask one question, though. It's a very naughty question. So we're just going to loosen things up, right? So when I first looked at the name of the town that you live in, Hot as Hell, I said, now I've got to ask you, is it hot as hell? You know? Yes, it is. <laughs> so so, so is, is that how they kind of named it? Yeah. So I guess that's where the name originates from. The story is that there were these two gentlemen that were exploring in the Kalahari Basin, found the town and literally experienced temperatures ranging up to 45, 50 degrees. Oh. And then the extreme of that is cold temperatures plummeting to minus five up to minus 10. So it's just 
yeah, it's either hot or it's cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's and it takes some getting used to. Yeah. Incredible. Well, I had to ask that. So South 32 is a globally mm -hmm. diversified mining and metals company that operates several mines in South Africa. What exactly does this mean from a social cohesion perspective? And how are you bringing diverse communities of people together within your organization to achieve social cohesion and a dynamic workplace for everyone in the company? Yeah, that's quite a interesting question. So I think um, you are right. South 32 is a global mining and metals company. And I think South 32 is wonderfully positioned to be able to impact the communities to build social um, sectors and to bring diversity together so i think what's really um key with south 32 is promoting diversity and inclusion i think with south 32's leadership um, that is core of the business and there is top-down support in making sure that cultural change is met but also ensuring that diversity goals as well are also well managed and tracked. Um, we remain committed to being inclusive. So diversity policies as well is really important for us to make sure that we are comprehensive in the way we manage diversity and committing to making sure that there's a respectful workplace for everyone to be part of. I think what's also really key is driving and promoting recruitment and retention. Our hiring practices are quite involved, but that's only so to make sure that we have the best people in our teams to be able to support the organization and what it stands for. Training and development is also key, not only for people who are, empl who, who, who are employed at the mine, but also for the communities. So with South 32 and the mines here in the Kalahari Basin, we're quite um, strong on developing the communities and offering programs so that the community can, can be better equipped for whatever it is that they, they need to participate in. I think um, for me, what I really appreciated of uh, or with the mines is that um, they really celebrate diversity and the cultures or the local cultures here. Um, it's a place whereby um, I've even learned to respect the local people, learn from them and draw from them as well, because it is certainly a different environment. And I guess you're only able to make headway if you respect the people that you work with and understand where they are coming from. And I think what's really important for me, like I mentioned earlier on today, is giving back to the community. Uh, we are mining a commodity that actually belongs to the people. So how do we make sure that they are set up, that what we are doing adds value to them as well and adds value to the world? Um, and I think through that, it's being able to collaborate as well with many, many different groups around the country. Um, I think another important element is making sure that we are driving feedback. So having mechanisms to share with the communities on what we are doing, how we are promoting, you know, the, the, the social circles or the social groups, if I can call them that, and really making sure that we are building a cross-cultural team. So we are quite a diverse workforce coming from quite a diverse community. So you see that in the workplace and it's wonderful to embrace and watch that because it's just a group of people working together with different backgrounds, different um, needs, but all, all, all coming together for one common vision and purpose. So I think that is what I appreciate about the company that I work for. Um, and at the heart of it all is to drive the safety guarantee. So without that, nothing else matters. It's all about making sure that people go home safe and well every single day. So that is where we are at as a company and that is how we drive social cohesion. Fantastic. Wow. I'm impressed. Um, the level of societal change and the multiculturalism that you spoke about, isn't that the South Africa we all fought for back in the day? 
Yeah. And here we have it. And it's coming from the mining industry and South 32 is driving that. I am thoroughly impressed. And I think that it is a very important aspect of business when you carry that level of not just uh, social responsibility, it goes beyond that. It's about humanity. It's about people yeah. coming together and that cohesiveness and just the way you, you mentioned it's taking place. It's, it's developing. It's evolving in that community. And you spoke about this tightness of the family in this little mining town. You know, uh, there is this sense of a smaller town being a dorp in South Africa. <laughs> and for those around the world, a dorp is literally a small town. And, you know, um, it's amazing. It's interesting, initially in a weird sort of way. And then one day you discover, hey, I like weird because I'm weird too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it is that, that's the beautiful part of it because mm. I, I, I experienced something similar when we had to live in the different cities of South Africa. But of course, we lived in the big city. And then we had to come to the garden route and settle in the city of George, which is much tinier than the other cities that we lived in. However, I haven't been to Potazel, mm -hmm. but from the description of it, it sounds tiny. Probably yes. like that TV program where those people, Igoli, was it Igoli? The people lived in the I, so. I think it was something like that. Mm. I could, or was it Isidingo? Isidingo. Was the program called Isidingo? We had a program, Isidingo, yeah, many, many years ago. People lived in this tiny little, is it like that? So it's interesting because from a social perspective, from a business perspective, you have all these tiny little groups of people that are now becoming cohesive. And what happens is a brand new culture develops. Mm. And that is fascinating. I find that personally fascinating. I don't know whether it's the artist in me or it's just how I see life. And the tightness that you described with your family, which I think is essential, the quietness of life, it ushers in the largest of life. Hmm. In a way, I think that takes us back to the original creation state. And I, I kind of got that when you were speaking about it. And who would think that would be found in a mining town? So I'm happy for you and your family that you've actually reached that place in your life. So let's talk about sisterhood since it's Women's <laughs> Month. What yeah. is your perspective of sisterhood and how are you finding, because you left a familiar place hmm. to go to an unfamiliar place. And uh, how long are you here in Hotezel? Yeah, so I'm now in the Northern Cape for five years. Five years, okay. Yeah. For five That's years. Long enough. That's long enough. And I am here in George for 10 years. So okay. I kind of understand your journey because yes. with each year, you sort of, you know, it's like when a child is growing up, you, you, you measure the child, you do these little notches. You know, parents mm. have that kind of thing. And so it's like that when you're living away from what is familiar or where you were born, because each year is another notch. And then you're measuring against your backdrop of where mm. you came from. And then one day, the best thing that ever could happen to anybody is you forgot where you came from, yet you remember it. You remember yes. it because you can never actually forget it, but you forgot. Mm. You now developed and evolved something and someone new, and you see the world in a brand new way. And that, for me, is the most fascinating part of life. And I'm hearing that from, from your own uh, story. Mm. So tell me how sisterhood develops in such a situation, Juvina. So I think um, for me personally, and, and a very dear friend and mentor of mine said that I will never be able to settle in and ease into the Kalahari in this little town of Hotazal and the mining sector if I don't go out deliberately and look for pockets of excellence. And I think in the mining sector, there are so few women in there. And back to our previous point, working on diversity and inclusion, 
and really embracing and recognizing the role of women in mining has become a big drive for South 32 and South Africa in general. I think with so few of us being in the mining sector, it's really important to carry each other. I think it's really important as well to embrace who you are and where you come from and to respect that and value that and honor it. I think for me personally, the way that I value sisterhood and constantly make sure that I drive it is to respect the backgrounds um, of each woman that I come across, but also uplifting her and carrying her. Um, there are many ladies that come into the mining industry of late. And I think it's really important to be real and to be open about your own personal life experiences. So that can be able, or that can help somebody out there. Uh, what's really key for me is mentorship and support and coaching. Um, we have a lot of younger female leaders that are coming into the business. So how do I show up for them? How do I role model for them? And how do I help them through some of the experiences and scenarios that they might be working through? Because it really is not easy um, breaking through into a mining sector. Um, I think for me, it's also important to raise awareness for female leaders and to drive that sisterhood in making sure that they understand how they are impacting the local economy, how are they impacting the mining sector and the value uh, that they can bring through how they show up as leaders as well. I think really important and something that we often talk about as female colleagues and even with um, those that report to us is how do we maintain a work-life balance? I think it's really easy to get sucked up into the working environment but it's important to maintain a work-life balance. It's important for yourself as a female leader, as a woman, it's important to find time for yourself. And it's important to create that balance for others who may not see it as yet. I think as women in sectors that are predominantly male dominated, you are so driven to succeed and to prove yourself that sometimes you end up forgetting about who you are. So I think as women, and to your point of sisterhood, it's important to remind each other about your value, your own personal value and worth, and to bring that balance when others don't see it. Um, so that's some of the ways that we think about it. I think I'm blessed to have quite a strong female circle around me here in uh, the Kalahari. And through each one, learning about life, learning about how to cope with different experiences, different challenges, and also being able to contribute to those upcoming female leaders, just by constantly being there and offering my own personal experience to them so that they can grow as well. Thank you. That was beautifully answered. And um, I think it would have been very encouraging as well. It will be very encouraging for women in South Africa who needed mm -hmm. to draw from this because I have to say there isn't a single woman or man on this planet that doesn't need encouragement. Everybody needs encouragement. And sometimes just to get through the day, someone needs that. And I think the way you speak, you have a presence, very warm, kind, gentle, deep presence about you. So I want to talk about your spiritual life and your commitment to God. Would you like to share that? I think maybe um, I really found myself with being here um, away from what is familiar, like, like you said. Um, like we were sharing earlier today, I grew up in a household um, whereby I had a granddad as a minister, my dad as a minister. So our lives were really about community work and community service and serving others. And I think um, you never really appreciate spirituality. You don't really appreciate your faith until you move away from what's familiar and all you then have to depend on is God. And 
what he can do for you if you have absolute faith in him. And I think with this move, um, and really it was a big move for my family and I, after living in KZN for 35 years, to leave behind family and friends and to start a new life was not easy. And I found myself relying more and more on God. And I think the one thing that really um, stood out for me and, and, and really um, strengthened my commitment in the Lord is that I need to be at perfect peace with where he has placed me and knowing that he has a plan and purpose for my life. I think every situation that I've dealt with has taught me something and has brought me to a point whereby I can inspire and encourage others to know that if your foundation is solid and if you have faith and if you're at perfect peace with where you are at, that immediately brings the trust in the Lord to know that where he has you is divinely ordained and you are there for a plan and purpose. So I think for me, it's every day waking up and knowing that God's got me. He knows what my day holds. He knows the plan that he has for my family, for my girls. Um, and again, it's being at perfect peace with where I'm at, despite the challenges. And there are some rough days, knowing that he still got me despite that. Um, yeah, so, so it's really grown. So my spirituality has really grown. But I think sometimes, like you say, it, it takes you being away from comfort, your comfort zone, to really uh, make you appreciate what, what you have and to also lean on a higher calling. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you for that. that. That is the truth about mm. all of our lives, a higher calling, because um, we can only do so much. And then there comes that point where you, you actually let go and you realize, oh my gosh, it's like that car, that self-driving uh, Uber, where you don't need the driver anymore. That's my life. That's what's happening. I'm not even driving this thing anymore. And that's, that's actually, it's a scary place to be, but also a very beautiful place to be. Because it's about, I think the best part of life is letting go. I think when you are vulnerable, for me, when you are vulnerable and really share who you are and where you come from, you actually open up yourself to learn and to grow. Yes. And I think um, that was part of my journey, um, you know, to really show up as my true self, to be able to let go. Mm -hmm. And again, to be at perfect pe peace with where I am at, at this point in my life with my mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a wonderful feeling because you are totally at peace. You don't need to worry about what tomorrow holds. You don't need to worry about what the next situation will bring because you know that God has got you. And I do believe he's brought my family and I here for a reason and for a mm -hmm. purpose. Mm -hmm. We may not have understood it in the beginning because the transition was really difficult, really, mm -hmm. really difficult. Like most transitions. Yeah. But to see how, you know, we have been able to persevere through that. Um, through many times where we could have just packed it all up and gone home, it would have been the easy way out but to persevere and to reap the rewards and benefits of that just by being patient and by trusting God, it, it, it really is amazing for me. Um, and I'm really encouraged by that every day. Marvelous. You're a very highly qualified woman. And uh, <laughs> obviously you've studied in depth to be where you are and you can do this. But if you have just that, without your spiritual backing it's really a hard life so i see where your peace comes from it makes sense and uh, it's a wonderful legacy to pass on to your daughters mm. i think they will appreciate it when they're much older and um, it's it's wonderful when a mother can leave something back for her child and mm. it's not tangible but it's something your child can carry for the rest of his or her life. And I think I think that's amazing. That is mm -hmm. just 
and you handle, you, you know, just having this conversation with you because you can tell this about having a conversation with somebody, whether you built for a challenge or whether you're not. And I hope and pray that as you've spoken so beautifully with such conviction as well, that whoever's logged on and watching, however they're watching, that you met their point of need because that's how we heal. We are all healers. Uh, every one of us has the potential to heal the other. As you say, by sharing our stories, by being authentic, by being real. And it's okay to tell somebody, you know what? I've had a really bad day. Oh, I'm mm. having a bad year. Oh, you know what? I think I'm actually having a bad life. <laughs> you know, that, that's fine too. Because we're all supposed to mm. fit in and help the other person. That's that's the key point for me of why we were created. Mm. Javina, I am thoroughly honored to have had this moment with you. I feel I feel extremely blessed to have interacted with you throughout this journey from the moment it started. Uh, I could tell you're a very astute person by the way you communicate and you're very thorough and just how you do things. You're meticulous. You have to be. If you're working in a mine doing what you do, one has to be meticulous. Mm -hmm. So can you just quickly describe to our viewers what exactly your work entails? Because in your promo, there is a photograph of you with your entire mining gear. So my question is, do you actually go underground? Yes, I do. Wow. Okay, we need yes, to hear about this. We need to hear about this. Yeah, so um, I guess here at the Hotazal Manganese Mines, which uh, is part of the SAW 32 group, we run two mines. So one is an open pit mine, so it's surface mining. And the mine that I work at is an underground mine. So in very simple terms, um, we would mine the manganese ore by blasting into the ore body. And that product then is moved to surface by a plant and equipment and machinery. My role in the production of that ore is to process it so that it meets the right size and the right dimensions and the right quality for it to be able to be dispatched to the market. So I run the surface plant production operations, which is responsible then for processing the manganese ore and then for dispatching that product by rail and by road. So we do a lot of um, truck loading whereby we would dispatch the product and obviously load the product onto trains as well. Um, so that's my role in the production environment. I think what's really um, important and key about a production manager role is to make sure that you know you have a high level of awareness in terms of planning and forecasting. I think that is really key to make sure that you meet the demands of the local economy and that you are planning for that. I think also what's um, really important as well is to make sure that safety concerns are well managed. Um, mining can be quite a volatile environment, especially underground mining. And there are serious risks involved. So making sure that you're clear on safety practices and protocols is really, really important. I think supply chain management as well is key. If we do not dispatch that product on time and we don't meet the needs of the local market and even globally, it can be quite a big impact to our business. So my role is making sure that when that train is at the mine and when the trucks are parked outside that mine, that they are loaded on time and they are moved to where they need to be at. I think also key for me in my role is making sure that I promote teamwork amongst the various teams. In a production environment, it's really, really important to work closely with your maintenance teams to make sure that your plant is reliable, to be able to meet those market demands. So that's really key in the type of role that I have. Um, innovation is important as well. As we are evolving in the mining sector and we are planning to ramp up, 
I think it's really important now to demonstrate innovation and to continuously evolve in terms of technology to be able to meet the growing market demand. So that's just some of the, the aspects that I drive. Um, there's many, many more that I can touch on. But I think the role as production manager is, is quite important, but also it's quite humbling because it really places you in a position where you, you have to demonstrate servant leadership every day. It's about being a support mechanism to people who are working around you, not actually doing the work for them, but to empower them to do what they need to do and to believe in themselves as well. And I think that is really important and critical when you are driving a production plant. Um, yeah, so, so that's just very high level, some of the things that I do. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful place to be at and a wonderful role to fulfill at the moment. Beautiful. It sounds like you have reached that moment in your life. <laughs> Whenever I do a new art piece, I always have to have a certain experience. And I describe it as moment in time. It, yeah. it was a moment. This is your moment in time. And Javina, you have been such a blessing on this show today. Uh, your, your authenticity, your calm approach, and doing this job makes you extraordinary because this is not even an ordinary job. There are men who wouldn't take on this job, and you have. So I can only imagine how proud your family must be your community outside of Patazel uh, and, and the Vessels Mine. How, uh, or, or what, was, what is the place called Vessels, outside of Vessels? How proud your family must be of you for who you are. You're still a very young woman. You have so much more to see in the world. And well, when I speak to you and engage with you, I can tell just where you're going. You're just going up. Although you're going down physically on the job, literally. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to ask too yeah. much about that because I suffer from a, from a little bit of claustrophobia and going down the mine shaft wouldn't be my idea of, you know, the daily job. But that you do it. You're not claustrophobic, are you? You can't be. No. Can't you be. Never were. You never were, right? Oh. So this alone makes you so amazing because just doing this and how often do you do it? So we have to be in field almost every day. So going underground, it's not something that I would do as often as being on surface because my role is more surface related. But I do go underground occasionally, um, sometimes once a month, sometimes once a week. It just depends on what the need is. Um, how we are set up is that the production departments are split between underground and surface. So there is a underground production manager as well and she's female a, a, a youngster who has grown in the mining sector um, who's also been placed in a wonderful position to lead the underground production teams so we are yeah a dynamic duo I would say being two female production managers in the mining sector um, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn from each other to grow uh, and to give back as well to the employees. That's great. And now the teams are male, mostly male. Yeah. I think it's time we had a female president as well. That, was... <laughs> that would really break through. The game changer. <laughs> Many barriers, yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be. So, Javina, it was wonderful speaking to you. And you do have a fascinating life. I don't actually think an entire show is sufficient to learn everything about you because you have so many facets to your life you know i know you're mining mangas manganese down there but you you're a diamond and you know you have all these facets to your life and each part is being polished and refined as you go through and who knows where this will take you so definitely we will invite you back on the show because I want to I want to keep track of this because this is this is one of the most interesting shows I think I've had. And this this people of purpose talk show, we have some amazing guests 
I have never met somebody who went down. One more question. How deep down do you go? It's not as deep as other mine shafts in the country, but it's about 450 meters underground that we work at. It's deep. <laughs> That's deep. No, not as deep. <laughs> so, quite fascinating. You'll never know that you're underground. It's like a city oh, down there. So, it's like a city you know. down there. Wow. And do you have like an office and everything there? There are offices, but most of the admin work is done on surface. But there are workshops underground. Um, there are refuge chambers underground. There are tea rooms underground. There are offices in there. So, um, yeah, it's quite well set up. So if well things up. don't work up above, uh, you'll know how to take us under underground, right? <laughs> yeah, we can keep safe there. A hideout, yeah. Uh, you know, it was lovely talking to you. It, it, you're interesting and also very engaging and you, your content was phenomenal well prepared and you know just shared so beautifully with our audience today thank you very much for making the time and for engaging with me throughout this entire journey uh, ever since we met for you to come onto this show thank you and the whole show welcomes you and thanks you and we're very impressed with what you do thank you and god bless you Thank you. I'm humbled. Thank you very much. God bless you, Jimena. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye.